Gentlemen, please welcome on stage. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's be different. <laughs> We're being radical. We moved our places. All right, first of all, gentlemen, uh, well done. These were all fascinating and very interesting talks, so yeah, we're happy. I hope you guys are happy as well. Uh, one of the reasons we are actually doing Ratsu is not only to communicate science and its wonders, but we also want to show the faces of scientists. And um, this is why I actually want to start with uh, probably a personal question for each one of you. Uh, how did you end up in these fields that you are currently working on? Because, I mean, yours is a complete nightmare. I mean, you, you, uh, you have to come with insights from literally nothing. You're doing maths and biology, for Christ's sake. And you, I don't, you know. So, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, if, if each one of you could just briefly say, uh, how did it all start? Did you play with animals when you were kids? Um, I, I can tell you that it was a, I was a, a, an undergraduate, so I was a first-year student, and I read an article in New Scientist, which is a weekly science magazine. So I was already at university, I was studying psychology, I was interested in behaviour, that's what I knew. Didn't know what I wanted to do. And I saw a, a paper in which they had made a Drosophila, a, fl a fly, a genetics, uh, geneticist friend, They'd made it a mutant. They had made a mutant fly that couldn't learn. And that it couldn't called, learn? It couldn't learn. It was stupid. It was called yeah. Dunce. They gave it a name. And I looked at that and I thought, my God, that's amazing. You can make something, affect something as significant as learning by making a mutation. And the prediction was that it was a single letter of DNA. Yeah. And so that precision really attracted me. And completely by chance, I had no idea, I was working in the, my, my university, which was the University of Sheffield, was the only place in the UK where people were carrying out that kind of research back in right. the 1970s. So I was amazingly lucky. I mean, that's the real point. I was interested, could see something, a principle, uh, and then was able to seize that yeah. chance just by luck. Yeah, if you allow me, you still have the 70s vibe, and I say this <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a compliment, by well, the way. Well, I used to have long, curly hair. But yeah. <laughs> Yourself, James. Yeah, okay, well, I'll try and keep it a relatively uh, short story, but the, the natural world, ecology, that subject I was interested in from a very early age. And I remember wh one year when I was about uh, eight or nine even, my, my parents uh, got me a, a Venus flytrap and a small microscope for my birthday, seeing that I was interested in these things. And I just got really, really into it. Someone even at that age said, what do you want to do when you grow up? Of course, everyone asks kids that. And they don't always do what they say. And I said, go to university and study botany. I just, without a moment's hesitation. I didn't exactly do that, as, as you said, right? So yeah. when I, I then went through various other phases. And when I got to be 18, I had to decide whether to go to university and what I would study, I decided to do maths because it was a very flexible subject. I also liked it as a subject. And I did it, it was a very difficult subject. It was, it was helpful. And then there was the other turning point was um, my interest in the natural world. I had the opportunity to sort of itch that scratch a bit by joining a field expedition in the summer, not as part of my degree, but just as a volunteer. So I saw the posters up and I thought, oh, I'm going to do that. I've always wanted to go to the rainforest. It's my dream. So um, I worked in Kodak Express all of my second year summer to earn the money. And then the second, the third year summer, I went into the rainforest and I was saying, oh, why didn't I do biology? And people told me, oh, well, you know what? You didn't do a bad degree, right? Mm -hmm. you, you should just use this degree yeah. for biology. So if you want to study as a postgraduate, just start looking for um, people that will take you to do a PhD using maths with biology. And so I started looking around on find a PhD. And I saw this PhD advertised, and it said, for a mathematician who wants to learn about biology, or for a biologist who loves maths enough that they don't mind doing right. a lot of that, or something along, along those lines, with a really a, a amazing supervisor, Stephen Cornell, his name was. And that's it. That's how I got into this intersection. Right. It does seem that it, it does take a peculiar type of person, I think, because uh, what you mentioned with the, with the microscope that you were given when you were a kid, I did the same thing. You know, it's like a bunch of microscopes at the house, you know, and they're looking at them for hours and then asking, what is it that you want to do now with your life? It's football. It's like, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there is, there is probably something, something additional that is needed there. So your story, Dave. Um, I mean, not dissimilar to James's, at least in the 
as far as anyone in my family can remember, I was just obsessed by animals. It was the only thing I was ever really interested in at any age. That never left me. I always wanted to be a biologist or a zoologist of some description. I thought all animals were interesting. I loved my dinosaurs, but I also liked lions and snakes and fish and beetles and yeah. lobsters and everything. <laughs> and um, yeah, I then I did an undergraduate degree in zoology, specializing in animal behavior. And then the PhD, I thought I was, I thought I had a PhD lined up and it fell through. So I went and did a master's to kind of Im improve my skills and do some other stuff. And I ended up doing a dinosaur-centric project as part of that, mm -hmm. though dinosaurs were just kind of the study animal rather than the core of the project. And then off the back of that, when I was hunting around for PhDs, it's like a paleontology one came up. And they went, well, you've already been doing dinosaurs, so you're basically a paleontologist. And here we are, pr pretty much. So I, I, I kind of just fell into the dinosaur side mm -hmm. of things. Yeah. But I, I still think of myself as a zoologist. Right. I, I think in general academic careers, some you know, highfalutin people think that they, they get there simply because they're brilliant, which is undoubtedly the case, <laughs> yeah. uh, in your case at yeah. least. Well done. But there's an also a huge amount of luck and just random yeah. stuff that happens yeah. and you're in the right place at the right time and it falls well and there you go. Sure. So, uh, you know, I think... It, the childhood idea of I'm going to be a professor yeah. of studying X is absolutely crazy because it's very right. unlikely to happen. But it's great motivation, but uh, yeah. random stuff is yeah. if, if, underlying if the, it all. If the fish yeah. biomechanics PhD had come through, I would not be here yeah, talking about absolutely. dinosaur right. social right. behavior. Right. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think we underestimate the role of luck uh, yeah. in mm -hmm. our lives, but we can also uh, guide it in a certain way. So it's, yeah. it's pretty much the same as evolution and genetics. <laughs> uh, so uh, stepping on that... Uh, the first question uh, that came in came in from from the audience and that I want to actually ask is uh, it's, it's, it's for all of you. I mean, most of the questions are like that, gentlemen. So feel free to buy in. Uh, is it possible at a certain stage, by looking at the current state of uh, of our understanding how genes work and the current tools that we have, uh, to actually have a real life X Men at some point? A real life X Men. <laughs> yeah. Um, well. Uh... <laughs> Starting with a serious question for you. Um, yeah. Depends what you mean by that. So uh, if you mean uh, an individual who can, uh, their eyes, you know, laser beams are going to come out of their eyes. I, mm, I'm going to say no. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think I'm going to say no. Uh, on the other hand, so, right, one of the, there are lots of fantasies about this. And one of the uh, things that people have been interested in is uh, reducing your sense of pain. And so, in particular, uh, President Putin's daughter is very keen on uh, trying to fund research in could we make a super soldier who would feel less pain? Of right? course That's not she one does. of the X-Men, as far as I know, um, by manipulating their, recept their pain right. receptors. But this would be manipulating an embryo, right? And we go back to what I said earlier on. You wouldn't actually ask that, you can't ask that individual, do you want to be the person who can't feel pain? Because if you don't feel pain, you're going to lose your extremities, right? So yeah. if you get leprosy, that's why people who have leprosy start to lose bits of their limbs because they, they get damaged. They don't realize yeah. you lose pr your peripheral senses. So I'm not sure that feeling, not being able to feel pain is, you know, it might, you might say, yes, we can create a super soldier, but that individual is mm. going to have all sorts of other problems. Uh, so I, I think I will probably say no in most cases, and I hope not, right? So right. I think there's a, as well as the kind of fantasy, whatever, I think whenever you talk about people uh, and doing things with people, there's a profoundly moral element that we, we can't forget, even when we're being lighthearted. Right, right. It's pretty much like x -Men, the movie. I mean, you see these amazing abilities, but the price is often, yeah. often yeah. very, very high. Okay, so... This is, this is done. There is, there is the question, though, if we do not go in this direction to improve humankind, whatever that means, because as, as we understood, it's a double-edged sword always. Uh, are we looking, uh, when we look into the future, more towards genetically enhanced human beings or more of a cybernetic type of human beings? I mean, have you thought about that? I well, I mean, they're both things that people are interested in. Uh, my view is the human beings that I think we can easily, most simply improve uh, the way we can most simply improve human beings and will the greatest good will be with clean water and sanitation. 
which isn't sexy, right? So yeah. I get it's not, you're not a cyber man, you're not an ex-man, but, you know, if all the tech bros who are really keen on these things, they, they're going to implant things in their brain. I mean, you all know who I'm talking right. about, right? I mean, all that money and investment and saving lives and making lives better, you could do so much more by ensuring that everybody has clean water, um, has uh, clean sanitation, has operations for cataracts so right. they can see, has glasses, you know, simple. That's the tech we need, right? Yeah. And that's an improvement, right? It's an enhancement, a pair of spectacles. But as one of the leading geneticists who works on, on gene editing said, we do not have equal access to spectacles around right. the world. So let's think about that, you know, buy specs for everybody who needs them, and that's going to change lives. Yeah. So when it comes to improving the human condition in general, what is your, what is your view, I mean, in terms of science uh, advancing the human condition, and how, how do you see it actually develop in the, in the future? No idea, never any, thought any about thought? it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, stuff's, my stuff's been dead a hundred million years. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure I know what's going to happen 20 from now. Right. Well, I have to deeply agree with everything Matthew has said, really, about the priorities and about, about how that's, that, that will come about by, by new technology. Those priorities will come about by, by new technology, but they won't be doing the, the next level of human, whether that's genetic or, or cybernetic. However, I, I, as you've mentioned X-Men, I think I must just tell you about the Wolverine frog. Um, mm. <laughs> because there, uh, we all know, or probably many of us know about the, the, the Wolverine X-Man who can um, eject these sort of sharp um, uh, swords out of his hands and, and use them to attack people. Well, there's a, a frog that actually does that. Um, uh, the, the swords are broken bones, so it, it's obviously scared enough of whatever threat it's got that it, it's willing to break its own bones and, and let those broken bones uh, penetrate through its own skin Holy and to use them as, as a weapon. Brutal. That's a real thing. That's not an ex-frog. That, that's a frog that exists. Wow. Yeah. It's a xenopus species, isn't it? Is it one of the xenopus? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I'd, have to, I'd, have to look that, I'd have to look that up. <laughs> Get on Google, everybody. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, uh, Odd feature that you that you just described. Uh, are there any um, interesting, like evolutionary trait that recently evolved, uh, either in humans or in other species that you that you can think of, like due to like very recent changes in in the environment? Yeah. So well, so a really clear one is uh, cane toads. So these big, big. I'm toads. sorry. Did you say chemtrails? Cane. Ca 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 <laughs> no, no, cane toads. Cane so toads. Ah, so these, okay. these big toads from South America that have been introduced to Australia and have absolutely devastated the wildlife in the east and northeast coast. Um, and they're a massive, massive problem. Uh, but they're also quite a good, interesting natural model in the sense that, or natural experiment in that people have been able to study them and, 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 and watch this. And what we found is that the frogs that, frogs, toads that live at the edge of the population, so between where there are lots of toads and no toads, are evolving longer legs because they can move faster and that's allowing them to spread into new environments and avoid the competition of where the other toads are. So over the last 40 years we've seen their leg length improve, increase, by only something like 5%, but that's enough to make a difference wow. that that population is now advancing faster. Yeah, there's another example of a, which happened completely by accident. Uh, so there's researchers in the Caribbean who are studying these lizards, and they've been studying the lizards for ages, they've been measuring them every year and all the rest of it, and that's their study site, fantastic. Then there was a big hurricane came along, and the island was completely devastated. So they go back to see what can they find. They find the number of lizards on the island has diminished enormously. And the ones that have survived have got slightly different length legs. It's the ones with, I think, the, the stronger front legs and the shorter back legs. So that, and they actually did an experiment. They got the animals with different legs, put them in a wind tunnel, and had them holding on to a stick. There was a net behind it. The fantastic videos, you can see this. And the frog, the, the lizard's desperately holding on, and eventually it, it blows away. And they showed that the ones with the, the shorter front legs and the longer back legs survived, were, could hold on longer. But that's not evolution, right? That is just selection. So clearly natural selection had blown away the ones with the longer front legs. The question is, what would the next generation look like? So they then had to go back three years later to see, 
was this character actually genetic and had it been passed on to the next generation? And the answer is yes. So they now have the population of lizards on this island now has shorter legs and slightly uh, shorter front legs and longer back legs than they did before. And it's the hurricane that's done that. Hmm. You? I'm afraid I'm blanking on it. <laughs> <laughs> any, any, like, fur, any further examples? But, yeah, but. yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering, do, do you have any idea what might, uh, considering, again, the way that we live and that we are going to live for the next uh, a few hundred years, uh, you as a god can obviously see the future. You know, I'm asking you to speculate wildly here, but uh, in terms of like human physical traits, how would you, how would you imagine <laughs> us changing? How would human physical trait? Well, well uh, so if we roll out playing with, um, with, with genetics in the way that, that Matthew yeah. warned, then, then what will happen is um, whichever individuals reproduce, uh, their heritable traits will tend to be the ones that are passed down. Um, okay, um, that's not good. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying that's good or not good. I'm just saying, you know, that's, that's how it works. That's how yeah. evolution works, you know, and the, the, uh, the world that determines how that happens has changed, and it's changed for the better because we're saving people from dying, we're saving people from pain, um, and I think that's all, all to the better. Uh, as to um, what that will actually mean, uh, I can't guess. I'd like yeah. to know yeah. what yeah. Matthew well, thinks. Well, I, I show a picture yeah. to my students that came out about 10 years ago. It was a study from LSE, and it said, this is what we're going to be like in 3,000 years, and we're going to have long, thin fingers to press a remote button, and basically we're going to be like a big couch potato because we're going to spend all our life mm. sitting in front of screens. But, I mean, that clearly won't happen. It's just nonsense because there's no advantage to any of those things. It's not like we use them more, therefore the, it's more likely to appear. In right. the, that's not the way natural selection mm -hmm. works. You need differential survival and passing on of genes depending on the character. And if you think about it, a lot of human characters are in fact not directly genetically, or not simply genetically determined. Mm -hmm. If you go to a museum, to, uh, a museum with, with suits of armor in it, yeah? then they're all about, you know, one metre, 20. Yeah. They're really small blokes, yeah. right? Yeah. And it wasn't that they sent their teenagers to fight. Yeah. It's that they, their food wasn't very good. The, the world's top, tallest nation, it's either the Dutch or I'm not sure who it's else it might be these days. Yeah. But, you know, the, you go and see Dutch men and they're absolutely immense. And it's just because they have been incredibly well fed over the last uh, few decades. So it's human height, which looks like it's being selected for evolution has nothing to do with that. It's simply food. So mm. lots of things about us. It depends upon your environment, what you're going to end up looking like. Yeah, yeah. And it's like sudden and extreme changes of the environment get a, that can actually trigger that. Probably the, the most recent differences biologically that we can see in humans are related like the tens of thousands of years ago related to migration and climate change. So if something big happens, then we might actually see people slowly starting to change, right? No, no. Well, really. I mean, it, it depends on whether, whether that <laughs> kills anybody or well, not. Well, that is right. Look, that's yeah. absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly that's I mean, the problem. Yeah, and there was a question, uh, there, there was a question being asked here that, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of strange that people are more afraid of genetics uh, than uh, the atomic bomb that is, like, looming over us all the time. But I, I, I guess that's just collective Well, I'm psyche. not sure they are. I and mean, that's one of the things I found in my book is mm. that... Uh, so I, what I you thought about was, well, what about, um, what's culture written about and what science fiction novels and films have there been in the last, in the 21st century about genetic engineering? And there's virtually nothing. The last really powerful thing was Jurassic Park, although it was also about dinosaurs. Um, and, you know, it seems like we've kind of moved on. We're not quite so worried. And that's partly why I wanted to raise this to say, hey, people, look, you do need to worry about this. And in a similar way, until recent events, not very far from here, uh, I guess we got used to the kind of relaxed sure. world of atomic weapons. Yeah. And unlike in my, when I was growing in those 70s, where we were absolutely terrified we were going to be yeah. dying in a nuclear you know, hellhole. Um, that didn't happen yet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we tend to normalize everything, so it's going to happen with genetics as well. Um, we have a question related to this... Um, you know, the, the evolution of the different sexes. Uh, can you, Dave, for example, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, explain why was this necessary again? 
So, I th well, so why it's necessary, talk, going back to the previous discussion and talking about physical laws, but in this case, ultimately, what probably triggered it is basic mathematics, um, which is, I'm sure at least some of you, this is where I find out if I had a very different experience to everyone else. When I was growing up as a kid and my family went anywhere, I said, if you get lost, stand still and we'll come and find you. That's the instruction <laughs> good, I was always given. It is, and mathematically, that's the easiest way for two things to meet. If they both sit still, they never find each other. If they both move, it actually takes much longer than if one stays still and one moves. So if you think about the very origins of sexual reproduction and the first species which start to produce something which is going to mix together and produce the next generation, those need to meet in a fluid because this, this is well before internal fertilization. And those things are going to need to meet. So what's the best way for them to meet? Well, we know mathematically it's one to sit still and one to move. Well, as soon as you do that, the sitting still one doesn't have to do anything, so it can be really big. In fact, the bigger it is, the easier it is to find. And then the moving one, the faster it can move, or the more of them, the better they'll be at finding it. So you've got eggs and sperm almost instantly, hmm. because that's going to be the best thing for both things to do. And now, immediately, you now have, as we said, you've got this certainty of maternity on one side and uncertainty of paternity on the other side and a much higher investment in a single big yep. thing or a few big things and a much lower investment in lots of little things. So there's almost spare energy in the male to go off and do weird stuff with it and more competition. And pretty much everything yeah. else comes out of that. I mean, the actual origin, you know, what you get out of sex is variability. Right, so you shuffle up the genes rather than if you're... Well, it's fun, too. Well, well, <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> single cell, cell... I'm going to have to put an electrode in and try and record from it. But, you know, the idea is you get variability. And so that's one of the explanations that's used. But I think it's still true that we don't know... There's no agreement on why sex evolved, right? I mean, it, it's one of the things that people argue about. So it, when you had single-celled organisms, you're going way, way back, whatever it is, 200 million, 2 billion years ago, something like that, yeah. uh, that you get the, the development of sexual reproduction. It allows more variability. Whether that was the reason or a consequence of mm -hmm. something else, and then there's a huge advantage mm. to it, uh, people are still arguing about. So, sort of a political and sociological question, I guess. It's a matter of politics. I mean, you all work in the, in the UK, uh, but you, for example, in your talk, you, you did show us the different approaches in the, in, the, in the US and the heavily regulated European market. So, uh, what, do you, what kind of environment do you think is most useful for science and innovation? I mean, where would you rather <laughs> work? In a laissez-faire kind of a <laughs> thing, or... <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's, you, you're going to get, it's all, con it's all conditional, obviously, in that, you know, open access and sharing of data and collegiality and resources and facilities are what's going to trump just about everything else, but that varies from institute to institute and mm. even within them and even within a department almost day to day, you know, you have good years and, and bad years. Um, I don't think there's necessarily anywhere that's particularly brilliant or even particularly terrible for science because it kind of depends where you are. Right. Like I, I spent three years in China and at the time their science funding was growing 10% annually from the government for about a 10-year window. Whoa. And at that time I was working in an institute which was in theory at least the premier paleontological institute in the world. That's perhaps not too difficult because there's about three. Um, but it was still, you know, an incredible place to work. But at the same time, there were enormous restrictions as a foreigner working in China. So yeah. was it good or bad? Well, yeah. it depends on exactly which bit you're looking at. I, I think the, the, the biggest problem, I mean, what you want is funding, right? You want lots of money and <laughs> yes, you please. want that money. You know, <laughs> everybody wants money and... Ideally, I've, I've moved towards the view that, in fact, that money should be allocated pretty much randomly. So one of the things that scientists do, waste an incredible amount of time doing, is writing a grant, writing a, a request, basically, to some funding body saying, give me a load of money to do something. And increasingly, you have to be able to say not only how you're going to do something, but actually what you're going to find out, as though you already know the result, right? When I find this out, this will mean this, this, and this. The impact. Yeah, yeah I, but I mean, you haven't actually done the damn experiment. So, right. in fact, what it's doing is leading to less and less 
ex you know, exciting and novel experimentation because you've got to do something that you can be confident of delivering. And the vast majority of grants don't get funded. So that work, which you've spent weeks, months on doing, one, is wasted. Two, you also get... I think we get a trifle upset when we don't get funded. So you've got a week or two of feeling absolute rubbish because you've been trashed. And rather than doing that, that, I think what we should actually have is, and it's been experimented, I think, in Switzerland, is that you have a kind of triage of, these are the crazy ideas, right? This is the person who's going to make a, um, you know, a perpetual motion machine. So let's not take account of them. The rest of them, as long as they're sensible, just allocate it randomly. And that way will save an awful lot of time and science will progress, I think, well, in interesting ways, because... Sorry, because yeah. I want to save a massive amount of pressure on academics. Yes, yeah. you know, yeah. Which it, is, you know, we're in a system in the UK, but again, it's not just the UK. Get a grant or you're fired. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I've seen emails and heard of conversations that are basically written like that. Yeah, and you, can't, gar you can't guarantee you're going to get it. So you're, you're, in fact, being asked to do something which is perhaps right. impossible. But the, the, issue, the problem is that governments all over the world because they're restricting, in one way or another, science funding, then want, they want that result. They want something they can do something with. So, you know, dead yeah. dinosaurs or rocks that used to be dead dinosaurs, not terribly interesting, right? Or even, you know, in exploring the tree of life or in my, my area, studying, you know, the sense of smell in a maggot. Why on earth would you want to fund any of that thing when we've got cancer, when we've got, you know, maybe climate change they're going to study? But we know that it's often the things you discover by accident right. or trying to find something else that somebody else can realize, I can apply that. And the current system, by restricting that imagination and focusing solely on what we think is going to be useful in five, ten years' time, I think that's creating a lot of problems. Right. I, I f agree with all of this, really. I mean, um, uh, the the open data, the openness, the, the yeah. funding, and the not wasting time on stuff. These are the big things, really. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure sure what else I can say, really. I mean, it is, it's definitely a problem with the funding, not just for the people who write the grants, but then also to evaluate the grants, to, yeah, feel, like you're, to feel like you're responsible, um, uh, and to not know what else might be funded or not funded, right. you know, in comparison to this, this probably quite great thing you're being asked to <laughs> review and, and to look at. And so there's a, there's a kind of... Um, well, there's, there's a thing in, um, in biology, um, like this runaway selection systems where, where one thing evolves and so that something else has got to and it keeps going and keeps going. And actually, we've got this going with the, the grant um, the grant scores as well, you know, so if, if everyone gets almost the top score, so then you have to sort of split min even more minutely the right. top score, so that some people are the top of the top and others are just the bottom of the top, and you're left with all of these these things that, you know, all of which are great. Um, uh, so I agree with random. I think maybe the one thing I would add to the randomness is probably it should be random, but um, tending to favour people who've been randomly unsuccessful yeah, in the past, yeah, right? Yeah, so it's ra it is random, and you can't sort of fire people if they fail at it. But um, yeah. but that also it's going to give after a while it's going to give people a chance to yeah, do something. Yeah. yeah, failing also gives us knowledge, right? So that's that's how yeah. science works. Well, so it uh, does it. I'm not sure it does. It just tells you you didn't get the grant. You don't yeah. you don't know why. <laughs> sure. and, yeah, yeah. You know. It's, I mean, I, I think, so you, the question was also about regulation yeah. and innovation. I think there's one area that I, I feel quite comfortable about working in the UK, uh, and that is in terms of experimenting with animals. So in the UK has some of the world's tightest regulations about experimenting with animals, uh, and that's because in 1830, we created the Royal Society for the Pre Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the RSPCA. Wow. So it's a royal society. In 1880, we created the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. So it took 60 years for the <laughs> Victorians to decide, well, maybe we should actually care about children wow. rather than animals. So the English and the British have got this long tradition of caring mm. about animals. But as a result, for example, it's extremely difficult to do uh, to make studies of, of primates. And I think that's okay. You can work on primates, and so something called deep brain stimulation, which can cure Parkinsonism. If you haven't seen this on YouTube, go and look. You know, people 
who've got terrible Parkinsonian tremors, having an electrode in their yeah. brain, and it just disappears as this electrical current is put through. And that was done at the cost of a number of primates' lives. I think right. it was 20 or so. And I, I'm okay with that. I think this restriction, but accepting it should take place in some cases, is legitimate and okay. But I know that some colleagues who work on rats and so on find it immensely difficult. Uh, and either they either think, okay, well, I can work on locusts because nobody cares about insects much, and maybe they should, or they go to China where mm -hmm. primate research is pretty much unregulated. And I think that's not quite so good. All right, uh, so you did mention that uh, it is possible to recreate the Spanish flu, right? From, they did uh, it. With, uh, yeah, with genetic engineering. So will it be possible to recreate extinct species from bone DNA? And what do you think about that in general? Don't do it. <laughs> they should do it? I mean, if it's... I mean, we, we ended up having a conversation amongst ourselves just the other night, actually. But, I mean, if I think it's something very recently extinct... Um, and I really do mean, you know, perhaps years. There was a, there was a marsupial... Actually, I can't remember if it was a marsupial or a, or a placental mammal. There was, there was a small mouse-like mammal went extinct in Australia literally about three years ago through climate change. Oh, it was a rat. Yeah, it was a rat. Yeah, it was a rat. Yeah, yeah, it was a rat. yeah. but on, on an island, that ground. island is now underwater. That, yeah. That's kind of the end of a terrestrial species. That's happened in the last few years. We have, you know near-perfect DNA, I really hope someone's got near-perfect DNA from it, but they should have done, you know. Um, and we've got very close relatives, and, you know, rodents are quite easy to keep in captivity. We've done lots of experiments on them. You're not, you're, you're, we're not really eating into the world's population of rats if we need to start a rat breeding program and yeah. use them as surrogate mothers and some, you know, or, <coughs> you know, IVF for rat. In that case, go ahead. Right. But I think that's little more than, you know, we've done stuff like that with black-footed ferret and gaur, uh, big cattle from India, and some other things where we've just used some cloning techniques on cells with surrogate mothers of closely related species. Mm -hmm. When people start talking about thylacines, so Tasmanian tigers that went extinct was about 1920, I get very sceptical. When they start talking about mammoths and dino chickens and everything else, it's somewhere between impractical impossible, an ungodly waste of money going back to the spectacles versus brain tech argument, and frankly immoral because you're, you're going to produce hundreds of weird, inviable, messy proto-animals which will live brief and unfortunate lives yeah. to achieve bugger all. I so mean, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I agree. But in fact, the, so the, the K island or whatever Matt, it was, Matt, yeah. rat, yeah. I mean, they did in fact clone the DNA, and it's fascinating what they have, you, they haven't got it all. They thought they had, oh. <laughs> and now they, it turns out that big chunks of the DNA are missing, and those are primarily, as it happens, to do with its sense of smell and so on. So if they were to use that DNA, it wouldn't, there's, be. It wouldn't be right. Okay, this is going to be an animal that wouldn't be able to function properly. And, I mean, it, they, as people will know, every five years they make a promise about having mammoths or whatever, but... They're now no longer talking about making mammoths or dodos. They're going to slightly alter an existing, say, elephant, make it a bit hairier, or a pigeon, making it a bit more like a turkey, and so they're going to, it's going to have dodo genes. But then, so just, just think about the elephant. I mean, Dave was showing us how immensely social they are. So we're going to carry out IVF on a... Uh, an elephant, we're going to inject... Which uh, is already an endangered species. Nobody's and done, and nobody's we, done. You know. right? But let's assume you can do that. The animal now then comes out. It's hairier. It's got various other adaptations, more fat underneath its skin. But maybe it's going to smell different. It's going to mm. look different. Mm -hmm. How are the elephants going to respond to it? I mean, they might be fine, but they might not. And if it's not, then you've done something absolutely terrible to that baby elephant, which is, you know, you've made it weird for your amusement... I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I'd, I'd, be really, I'd really love to see mammoths, I'd love to see dinosaurs, <laughs> but I can't do that, right? And there right. are things we just need to accept and then move on. Like, we're all going to die. I mean, I wouldn't like to live forever, but we're all going to die and we have to accept that difficulty as it is. And the dinosaurs did die and the mammoths did go extinct. And I think that is an important... Just as knowing you're going to die is a really important piece of being human, knowing that this stuff isn't there and we should therefore care for the stuff that we do have... I think's a better message. 
Yeah, I mean, for, for my part, I definitely think we should focus on the species that aren't extinct, um, <laughs> or, or, or at least the species that went very recently extinct and would still be suitable for this environment, you know, so we really just, it's our fault and it happened very recently. Uh, um, uh, but I, I think that it is worth, just from a pure speculation perspective, to keep a biobanks, to keep frozen oh, yeah. samples of things that we think may go extinct, um, uh, because, w again, it's this idea of you know, future options. We, don't, we have no idea what's going to happen in the future or what we're going to need or be able to use them for, or what the ethical issues will be then. Um, and if we look at you know, this scrolling list of species out, out there on the display, seven. 7,000 to 8,000 critically endangered species, almost all of which will probably be extinct in the next 50 years if you just, just look at the way, uh, the way things are going, um, then, uh, I mean, we should stop that, but for the sake of keeping a few freezers on, it's worth storing their DNA. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think we should absolutely do that and just keep um, reassessing the ethics at uh, every stage as we see new technologies coming in to decide you know, if they're of use or if they're, they're, they're dangerous. Yeah, and, and the key example of this is, is real and is done already, and that's the big seed bank in Svalbard up yeah. in the Arctic Circle, which is an, an absolutely astonishing and essential part of human, humankind's patrimony. We've been growing plants for whatever it is, you know, five, 10,000 years, and there are lots of plants we have eaten in the past but don't anymore and there are other plants that we could eat and they are keeping the seeds up there and regularly people put in seeds that they have kept and in the future you know, because it's so cold the seeds aren't going to germinate and within the next several hundred years maybe these are going to be really useful to us much yeah. quicker than genetic engineering it's already been done by natural selection yeah, and actually, the Western Underground Orchid from my talk, these nine individuals, there is a program to, to get the seeds and to, to save them in this way. Um, uh, but but I, do, I do also think it's worth biobanking animal material yeah, yeah. Um, so that we have that too, although it's not, it's not so trivial as, oh, we've got a seed so we can plant it and we'll have that again. You know, it's, it's only really fully extinct in a sense when all the seeds have gone. Animals aren't the same, but they're still worth mm. biobanking. Well, but, but even, even with some other plants, so there's, I, I can't rem begin to remember the species name, it was a small cactus looking thing, but a botanist colleague of mine, we were in Kew Gardens in, in London, and he showed me this, he went, oh, you know, you'll be interested in this, and it's a fairly boring looking cactus, he went, that's one of three in the world, and all three individuals are male, <laughs> so it's alive, but it's also kind of functionally extinct. But it, it's a plant, so you can graft it. So well, right, clones, and so, right, right, but you know. again, that's <laughs> right, but it's something different. But that's outside of the seed yeah. bank realm. Yeah. But also yeah. something that can be manipulated, and something can yeah. be done with it. Yeah. That it's is so sad. Three yeah. single males. Well, there, there's the story of Lonely George, <laughs> right? Yeah, Lonely <laughs> George, yeah, right. Um, who, who, uh, this is a, 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 one of the species of giant Galapagos tortoise, and uh, oh, Lonesome it, George. It's a, Lonesome George, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, they're, they're an example of where you've had evolution happen separately on each of the Galapagos Islands. And uh, because uh, the way that the tortoises mate, the shells have to, to, to match up, otherwise they just can't do it. And so tortoises from one island just couldn't mate with tortoises from another island. And then um, a Lonesome George was left as the last individual of his species from a certain one of these islands. And he was alive for, for quite a while, but obviously everybody knew that eventually he would die and the species would be extinct and that. That has happened not so long ago. Why they didn't pick him up and move him to the... Because the shells aren't the right shape. It won't work. No, it, it can't, can't fit. Well, and, can't and, and, yeah, but those other tortoises are not in high numbers. <laughs> and now you've taken a female out of the breeding pool to make a hybrid that's not the yeah. same species. You don't know what yeah. the hybrid would probably not be viable. Maybe well, it, right, would, yeah. then it might well be sterile, right? Like, yeah. The, yeah. like a mule yeah. between a horse and a donkey. Right, right. So in which case you've wasted everything. I mean, it's yeah, it's a, not that simple with animals. No, no. No. Three questions about dinosaurs that you probably get all the time, and I apologize if you have to answer them for a hundredth time, but okay. Oh, it'll so, be more than a hundredth. <laughs> do we know, do we know how, how they smelled? What color were, were they? And if it's so difficult to differ differentiate from looking at bones, who was female and who was male, how do we know they were not hermaph uh, hermaphrodites? So, um, do we know what they smelt like? No, but at least some of them have a very good sense of smell based on the shape and structure of the brain 
and the shape and structure of the nasal passages. So it suggests that smell was very important for them and almost certainly, you know, th these are complicated animals. I didn't, despite what I was saying about, you know, the lack of data, you know, even most re modern reptiles are actually, I think most people greatly underappreciate how complicated their lives and behaviors actually are. The idea that dinosaurs are just these dullards simply isn't true. And again, across 1,500 species and 175 million years, they're going to exploit every communication and system and behavior and social reality within it, them. Except, so one of the interesting Some things... Some excluded phenotypes. Well, no. <laughs> so, apart from pheromones, right? So yeah. one of the interesting things is that reptiles, some reptiles do use pheromones, but birds do not. There is no known pheromone in birds. Hmm. So there may well yet be discovered. They use the sense of smell a great deal. They use for navigation, identification. But as a pheromone, no. So, and crocs, which are the other closely related group, they kind of maybe have these glands that have been suspected to be pheromonal. So they, they could certainly smell stuff, but whether they would have you know, laid down trails or used them to identify each other um, or to find a mate... I don't know, and that's, well, we'd probably never be able to prove it, I guess. No, but you, so you've got this Cetacosaurus from uh, China. It's the specimens held in Germany, but it's from China, with an extremely well-preserved cloacal region, so mm -hmm. that collective exit, and it has a giant, pe well, giant, but odd pair of bulges surrounded by odd scales on them around it, and that's pretty similar to what you find in lizards that have some kind of scent mm -hmm. gland. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... That's, That's nice. good. leading. I that. Okay, so change my lecture. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's it's at best leading. Yeah, oh, um, that's good. So the, the 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 appearance part. So that same specimen is one where it's so well preserved you can actually see the patterns. You can see stripes and spots on it, and dark and light. Um, I always used to say color is something that not only do we not know in dinosaurs, we'll never know in dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And now we sort of know it a bit for some. Um, so basically where we have some extremely well-preserved uh, specimens with skin and feathers, um, there are basically tiny subcellular packets of color that are made to give us color. We actually have exactly the same system ourselves. These are called melanosomes because they mostly contain melanin. Um, and by just an evolutionary quirk, the shape of the melanosomes is fundamentally tied to the pigment that is inside it. Uh -huh. So the analogy I use is, you know, you go to the DIY store and red paint's always in a square tin and blue paint's always in a round tin and white paint's always in a octagonal tin. You don't need to see the color to know. Oh, wow. You don't see, you, the shape will tell you the color. And we still have the shape. But you don't have a lot of skin. But we like have, a, we don't have... A, we have very few animals that preserve that well enough. B, of the ones that we have, the, currently you have to cut them up, basically, to do it, mm -hmm. or at least damage parts of it, and people don't like that. Um, the third problem is that tells you bits of color, but not the whole thing, because there are a lot of other ways of making color that we can't detect. Uh, and also, finally, it's one individual. So, for example, yeah. there's a little feathered dinosaur called Anchionis, something that I've worked on, and we think it's kind of black and white mottled with some red on the head. But that's one individual. We don't know if it's male or female. We don't know if it's adult or juvenile. We don't know if that's summer or winter plumage. We don't know if it's an odd one out, and maybe it's unusually dark, like a black leopard. Um, we don't know if in the north they were more white and in the south they were more black. It's an animal. It's not the right. species. So here's something else that you don't know. Uh, it's because uh, it seems <laughs> it's always well, but it's, it's one of those things. That the more you, you know, we worked this out. Everyone, this has totally changed our understanding of dinosaurs. It's like no, it's one individual. Yeah. G yeah. Give give me fifty of them. Yeah. And it'll tell you something. Well, I mean, m my favorite dinosaur uh, for b because of Jurassic Park, of course, is uh, are the Velociraptors because yeah. they they were at least uh, shown as to be the smartest of, of yeah. them all. They worked in groups. They were cunning. They were you know, very yeah. smart. Uh, is there a way to estimate, like, the intelligence of these creatures? And if you have to point out a single one that is the smartest dinosaur, can you do that confidently? Um, the way to estimate it is basically to look at the volume of the brain and compare it to the size of the animal. We have massive brains compared to our size. So do dolphins. Um, so do most primates in general and, and, and various other things. That comes with a list of caveats that would fill a couple of books. Um, so, 
it's the it's like democracy, you know, it's the least worst estimate of yeah. intelligence available to us. It's a terrible estimate of mm. intelligence, but it's the only one we've got. Based on that metric, there is a small dinosaur called Truodon, which is actually very similar to Velociraptor, or to be more accurate, very similar to actual Velociraptor rather than Jurassic Park Velociraptor. I'm about as similar to Velociraptor mm. as the Jurassic Park ones are. Um, Velociraptor, can, can you should, be, why, Velociraptor yeah. should be about this high and about this long and as feathered as a bird. So Not like a, two like meters turkey, tall right? and what? And Seriously? Scaly. Yeah, it's yeah. like a turkey. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great question I always get from kids. It's like, could you win in a fight with Velociraptor? It's like, yeah, yep. I'd sit on it. It's, it, weighs, <laughs> it, it weighs about 10 kilos. I'm just, oh, just going to that... crush it. <laughs> a Velociraptor <laughs> is a big? No, that, not even, not even that's that. It's a turkey. Big tur the, the, you do know it's a, a, a fictional film, right? The, the, They're the, in the CGI or robots. It's the, not, the, head, the heads are about this big. About I am so disappointed right now. That's absurd. Yeah, I know. Um, so <laughs> Trudon would be about that size and would similarly be feathered. Right. Um, but it's got a very big <laughs> brain, or to be more accurate, a very big brain cavity, because the brain doesn't fully... <laughs> <laughs> the brain doesn't fully fill that cavity, um, so there could be a lot more other stuff in there right. compared to its size. That We think they're relatively clever animals. We think they're operating in cluttered environments, which we know is one of the triggers of intelligence. It's got relatively long and dexterous arms, so it can probably manipulate things. We know that's linked to intelligence. It's probably relatively smart for a dinosaur. That's about as far as you can go. But it, it, you know, so people might say, well, wait a minute, where's the dinosaur civilization there? If we go digging, you know, yeah. is there a dinosaur Atlantis? If you find it, let me know. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Uh, but, well, okay, let's go back to the example of birds I gave earlier on. I mean, crows have been around for corvids, they're about 20 million years or something mm. like that, their lineage. And let's say they've been smart all that time. What have they done with it? Not a lot. Uh, they can make they little don't hooks need to. to get... Yeah, they can make hooks, brilliant. <laughs> or, you know, um, otters, sea otters that are smashing rocks yeah. onto to bits of shell. I mean, lots of things are intelligent and using tools, and that's all that happens. We ended up doing some, something very, very weird because of events in Africa, whatever it was, a million years ago, say. And that, we don't know what that was, but our lineage is very, very different. Mm. And our use of tools and our intelligence has, has ended up being at a different place, as far as we know, from any other animal. So even those that are smart, even if your Truodont was, you know, doing all sorts of funky stuff, they didn't build towns, as far as we know. Yeah. All right, so we are close to the end of our discussion now. I'm going to uh, ask you, well, I asked you in the beginning, why did you become scientists? Uh, I'm going to ask you now probably the same question, but in a different way. Why do you keep doing it? And um, obviously, you came, you came here, you traveled all the time. You, know, you are uh, you know, heavily engaged in, uh, in science communication. Explain to us why is it important first to do science, then to do science communication, and then if you can end up with a, with a, like a broad message to the audience, whatever it is that you, that you want to say. So we're going to start off with... Uh, why do I think it's important to do science? Well, I... I often say that the most important words in science are, we don't know, right. right? So knowing stuff is great, right? And we've talked a lot about stuff we know, and we've learned stuff from each other in the last few days because we didn't know things, they tell them, that's amazing, look it up, oh, God. But, you know, you've all got the whole of human knowledge in your pockets right now. You've got access to it. So knowing stuff is not necessarily amazing. Mm. What's really exciting is realizing what we don't know and then thinking, how could I find an answer to that, and sometimes it's impossible, or you could think, I could make a tiny step. So that is the most intriguing part of, you know, thinking about being a scientist, and then when you actually get the data back, trying to interpret this mess of numbers, and trying to think about the explanations, and sometimes we were talking about this in, in, in the break, that the numbers push you somewhere you don't want to be, and right. you can't, you don't agree with this, what it's telling you and you do every control you can think of, and you end up trapped in this place you never wanted to go to, because it's not something that you thought was true, but that's what the data so tells you. So, in a sense, it's masochistic, yeah? yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's a really exciting moment, because yeah. you've been proved wrong, which right. is good, it's really exciting, and you've been proved wrong by your own experiment, or it telling you something extra. Uh, in terms of why science communication is important, well, as you've seen, I'm, I, not only interested in my work, I'm also interested in what other people do. 
And some of this, I think, people need to know because it's changing our world or could do, and we need to all have a view about it. I also think that, I mean, I'm, I'm paid by uh, a British university, which is funded a little bit by the government and mainly by students who are taking out big loans. And so I'm, you know, I, I'm paid by lots and lots of people. And I think I therefore also have a responsibility to give some of that back to everybody right. and say, well, I know this, how can I explain it, perhaps inspire future generations or simply inform people of my own age. That having been said, I'm retiring in a year. So, no. yeah, I'm getting old. Well, too old for marking yeah. essays by students. So, in a year's time, I'll be uh, stepping down from my day to day activities. But I'm still going to be thinking about stuff. Yeah, and, and writing books. Writing hopefully. books and stuff like that. All right, that's good. Yeah, well, okay, why do I keep doing science? Why do I think it's important? Well, science is, is effectively, as Matthew has said, it's this process by which we very slowly and with lots of errors along the way try to expand the knowledge of humanity as a whole. And we've got a lot of problems, as we've seen, um, and I, for one, believe that the, the solution to those is going to be to learn more stuff, right? And, mm. uh, and therefore, um, it, it is nice to be the, the, the tiniest weenie cog of a tiny weenie cog that, that might one day contribute something to that. You know, that, that's nice. So I think that's worthy. And it, it's not always obvious what will come out of it and why some of the things that, you know, I've been most pleased with that, I've done have just come from chance meetings or chance things that have happened that could easily have not happened, you know. You might have just sat on a different table for breakfast at a conference, you know, life would have gone a completely other way. You might, you might have not even been able to remain in science. Um, so, uh, so there's all of that, but I, I think it's worth pointing out as well that the scientists themselves don't always know what the implications are, and they're sometimes quite profound. So a good example of this was the, the, the person who first discovered and made the first equipment for transmitting and receiving radio waves. And um, someone asked, oh, you know, what, what's the point of your invention? And, and, and he replied, oh, no, nothing, I guess. <laughs> you know, he just couldn't, couldn't see it. Well, <laughs> guess, guess what? Phones, television, yeah. the, the internet, you know, an absolutely wave of technology. This microphone I'm saying these words with, they're all using that kind of technology. He just couldn't see it, but someone else saw it, and it happened because of those initial inventions. So it, it's like a lottery, really, um, but it's worth playing um, for, for humanity as a whole. Um, so then why science communication? Um, well, I, I think it's very important that science um, not be done, you know, in isolation. In, it's being paid for often by the public, this funding that we've said we want more of. Well, that's coming from taxes. So for that to just go into, a, you know, a dark hole somewhere and, and be apparently wasted without explaining, you know, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, we've discovered these things, you know, maybe, maybe we'll find out they're wrong, but, but we're, 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 we're doing this. I think that's really important, and I think it's important for, you know, as Matthew also said, inspiring future generations of potential science, scientists and, and, and in, in inspiring scientific understanding um, among people who, who don't wish to be scientists, but you know, who will derive some benefit and enjoyment from understanding these facts about the world around them and how it works. I mean, I'm struggling. I'm going to struggle to <laughs> top those two answers. I mean, it, it's not for the paycheck and it's not for the dopamine hit of marking the thousandth essay <laughs> <laughs> or sitting in teaching meetings about what do we do about chat GTP and exam answers. Um, yeah, you know, there, there is a thrill of discovery at, at an individual level, which I think is always fun. And there's yeah. a fundamental collegiality to most science, which makes it incredibly rewarding. But as James said in particular, you know, I, I, I agree, you know, if, if we're going to solve humanity's problems, self-created or otherwise, science is, is it, yeah. um, basically. And equally, yeah, you, you never know what's going to turn out to be useful in profoundly unexpected ways. Um, and all, all things ultimately intersect. Yeah, is, is my work on dinosaur social behavior going to contribute to solutions of climate change or gene engineering? Almost certainly not. <laughs> but I've, I've had emails from people going, if I hadn't been into dinosaurs as a kid, I would have ignored science. And I didn't, and it got me into science, and then I did physics for a degree. And now I work for the European Space Agency, and I landed a probe on Mars. 
and dinosaurs did that. And that was the email <laughs> I got. And yeah. boy, that's a thrill. But it, it, it shows that actually that, yeah, that inspiring generations is a real thing. And the intersection of ideas and studies is a real thing. Um, it didn't come off, but a friend of mine was doing some work on pterosaurs, so the flying reptiles, and we'd done some work on wing structure, and uh, the US Navy contacted him because they were interested in next generation wing suits for the Navy SEALs. And it's like, you would not have guessed that that was coming from mm. looking at the blood vessel patterns in pterosaur wings. <laughs> but, right, but you wouldn't. And, and the sort of thing that Matthew was saying, no one is going to write a grant pitch going, well, I really want to study pterosaur wings to try and understand how animals which have been extinct for 100 million years flew. Yeah. And it, but by the way, it might help aircraft design. Uh, I know of three different aircraft designers which have looked at pterosaurs for a model of next generation aircraft. This stuff <laughs> happens and intersects in ways you genuinely can't predict. So yeah, the lottery analogy, which I'm going to steal because that's great. Um, you know, that, that really is there. Um, and yes, yeah, science communication is a part of that. Again, as both of them said, at some level, taxes and other things paid for our education mm. and our jobs and, and our research and what we do and we want to give back. Um, personally, I also quite like it. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's nice to tell people exciting things and yeah. get them excited about the same things yeah. I'm excited about. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I've never met, you know, we've been doing Grazio for 12 years, I have never met a scientist who is unhappy <laughs> that he's a, he or she is a scientist. So I sort of envy you, and at the same time, I'm grateful for the work that you are, that you are doing. So thank you very much for being our guests on the, on the forum. Thank well, you for having thank us. You, thank you, Grazio. Yeah. Thank you, the audience. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.